project elect, enthusiastic leaders engaging in changing times. As a, uh, a youth, we live in a segregated era. So you live knowing that era and you just kind of accept the things as they are, not really looking back and saying, well, wait a minute, we are being treated unfairly here. So that's, that's a pivot point for me because when most people get out of Mississippi, especially about that time, and I'm just kind of learning a lot of that history, you know, if I ever get out of here, I'm not, mm -hmm. not coming yeah. back. But you knew what you were going to face probably when you got back. Oh, no question. I came back for it. Hello, good evening everyone. My name is Robert Hall. I'm the chairman of Project Elect, enthusiastic leaders engaging in changing times. Uh, we're happy to celebrate uh, Black History Month and going into the Black History Month with Project Elect with none other than civil rights attorney, Mr. Kenneth Darrell Mayfield. Hello everyone and welcome to Black History Moment. Uh, we're so happy to have Mr. Kenneth Darrell Mayfield, uh, who I know is a civil rights icon for the state of Mississippi. Welcome, Mr. Mayfield. Thanks for the invitation. It is a pleasure to actually have this moment to, to just sit with you for a little while and for you to give us the time as Project Elect. Uh, I want to dive right in because we know time is of essence. Uh, can you tell us just a little bit about your background and history in, in, in Oklahoma coming up? Yes, uh, Oklahoma is my hometown. Mm -hmm. I was uh, reared on a farm outside of Oklahoma, about six miles uh, west of Oklahoma. My father was a sharecropper. In my young younger years, he later uh, start, started working on the railroad, moved to Gary, Indiana. And he was killed in an automobile accident when I was like nine years old. And so my mother raised six of us. I had one older brother, one sister, three younger brothers. And I knew hard work. <laughs> I knew hard work from, from the farm. We said cut crop right. Yeah, yeah. Hard work there, yeah, so. we picked cotton. We uh, hauled hay, pulled corn. Uh, my mother was industrious. She. Uh, would have one of those big freezers and she'd fill it up full of food, you know, and that's how we got fed with the vegetables and then uh, she'd get a couple of hogs, you know, and <laughs> fatten them up, you know what I mean, and, and get us through the winter months. But uh, it was, it was, uh, life was really good as a, uh, a youth. We live in a segregated era, but uh, at that time you really didn't realize that you were a second class citizen. You, you mm -hmm. just kind of roll with the flow, if you will. I remember the, probably the first time it really became real clear to me was uh, when somebody started talking about Emmett Till and how he was murdered. Well, he was murdered, I was like four years old. That's how we were at that point. Yeah, and they talked about this Emmett Till thing and, and how you sort of need to remember your spot, you know. Mm. And so there in, in Oklahoma, some of the stores were segregated. Uh, some of the, uh, I mean, when I say segregated, I mean, you. You could actually go in the store, but you'd have to go to a certain counter, hmm. a certain area. Same way with some of the food places that we were allowed to go to. There was a dairy bar, an outside dairy bar, and it had like a wonder in the front that faced Highway 45, and a wonder to the side near the back of the little dairy bar. And the blacks had to go, I mean, this is an outside <laughs> wonder, right? And we had to go to the back of the outside of this little hut. That was a dairy bar. Now, did it dawn on you as a kid then that there was differences, major differences on who you were as, as a, a young black boy? It, it, it was. The thing that was not clear to us is that we had a choice. Like we, the, it was almost like being born uh, a woman or a man. You, you don't have a choice on that. Right. And a woman could say, well, you know, uh, did you realize that women were treated differently? Well, yeah, but that's just the way things work. So coming up in that era, in that segregated uh, era, mm -hmm. second class citizenship, that's just the way it was. So some people were more fortunate than others. Some had running water, <laughs> but we didn't have running water. So you live knowing that era and you just kind of accept the things as they are, not really looking back and saying, well, wait a minute, 
we are being treated unfairly. So let me ask you this. So as you were coming up as a child, and I, I was reading in, in one of your books, and we'll get to that, where you went to, was it Oklahoma High School then, or was it a different? Um, no, it was Fanny Carter High. Fanny Carter High. Yes. And that was a black, that was a black high school. It was grades of 1 through 12. And we actually moved to that school 59, hmm. 60 school year. It was a, a new school building. And uh, man, things started really looking up then. We had a brand new school building, you know. <laughs> and so, did you realize you was poor? I mean, and I'm trying to just kind of imagine back then when, when you read. No, school. no, no. I, I'd have to say the answer to that would be a, a N O. And I'm, I'm going to tell you why. Because uh, we were we were more fortunate than uh, most of our neighbors. My uh, my grandfather and great-grandfather were all land owners and, and whereas my father chose to be a sharecropper, mm -hmm. he could have farmed on my, my granddad's property and, and matter of fact before he left Mississippi in I think 1955-56 era, uh, he actually tried farming mm -hmm. and uh, didn't work out, didn't work out, he mm -hmm. lost, lost uh, the, the equipment that he had uh, that he had uh, bought on credit and he left and went to uh, initially racing in Wisconsin and took a public job. Wow. So, but our neighbors, for example, uh, we had a little home that was sitting there on my grandparents' property on the pasture, if you will, the cows and chickens and mm -hmm. hogs and all that running all around your, your, your house. But it was actually our house. Our neighbors lived in somebody else's house. So they were poor and they didn't have the, they didn't even have an automobile. Mm. We always had an automobile. So we were middle class. <laughs> <laughs> no running water. <laughs> was, it, was, it, was it too bad at the Mayfield House? Not too bad, not too bad. <laughs> didn't have a TV until my father was killed in this car accident I was telling you about. And that happened in 1961. Uh, he was on his way home for Christmas, as a matter of fact. It was a pretty interesting story. He and a cousin were on their way home for Christmas. The weather was so bad up in Illinois that they turned around, went back, and waited till the weather cleared some. It cleared, and my cousin was unable to make the trip home with my dad at that time, mm. so he came by himself. And uh, on, on Highway 57, I believe it was, on his way wow. back home, is where he lost control of his car, hit a bridge, and and was killed uh, instantly. Wow. They say, well, he had a little 13-inch TV in his car that he was bringing home for Christmas for us, and that TV survived the crash, and it was a horrible crash. Uh, as a matter of fact, he hit the bridge, tumbled, went down to the wow. creek, and mm -hmm. yet. The TV survived. He had wow. the trunk packed pretty good, you know, mm -hmm. with clothes and all that stuff like that. And uh, so, so we started watching TV uh, at our home in 1961. So, we were we were middle class. <laughs> okay. Yes. So uh, you went on, graduated from high school, high school. at 16. Yes. At 16. Yes. Now you came up with this idea, and I, I'm trying to remember from your book. You came up with this idea that you were going to go to college. Yes. College. No. And I don't think at, at Ole Miss that there was too many uh, no, blacks no. at the school then. No, right? no, no. If, in 1968, uh, most of us, my classmates, I bet you over half of my class went off to college. We had more students, uh, black students, going off to college then than mm -hmm. we do now percentage-wise. Uh, that was that era when it was time to do something, you know, it was a wake-up era, a time of awakening, you know. Uh, James Brown was coming up with his songs <laughs> and you know what I mean. And so we were feeling that things were going to change. So I had a choice to go to, uh, of course, Jackson State. My oldest brother went to Jackson State, uh, considered Jackson State. But I really wanted to integrate. My mother was just simply fearful of what would happen to the family if we went to the white school. Now you brought up Ippy Till earlier. Do you think that that was some of the reason that your mom? Oh yes, yes. Was, yes, a, was yes. afraid of that? Yeah. 
And the National Strays ran, the National Strays runs across Highway 41. That's about a mile and a half from where my mother is still living, you know, at the age of 91. And uh, they had painted on the Natchez Trace Bridge, Ku Klux Klan. Now we're talking Tupelo Lee County area. Yes. Mississippi. Okay. Yes. All right. Yes. Uh, that was painted visibly. Okay. Stayed there for I couldn't tell you how many years. Mm -hmm. Nobody erased it for years. Mm -hmm. Ku Klux Klan wow. was on the bridge. So my mother was just simply fearful uh, of, of what would happen and. and she pleaded with, uh, actually my oldest brother, she had to plead with him. I was kind of going along with my oldest brother, really. Mm -hmm. uh, but she asked him if he would consider uh, staying at the black school. And uh, so he finally consented. Of course, naturally, you know, I agree, mm -hmm. he consented to it as well. So, but that thought of that idea that you could get a little better education mm -hmm. at a white school was in my mind. I just felt like, oh man, this is gonna give me the stepping stone that I need because my ultimate goal was to get into Harvard Law School. And so I said, I go to a, a top university. At that time, I thought Ole Miss was like in the top <laughs> 10 across the country. You know, I didn't mm -hmm. really realize Ole Miss was, you know, not really in the top 10, okay? <laughs> so, Mr. Mayfield, you got into Ole Miss, obviously. Yes. Uh, you got in there, uh, I guess actually you got accepted, started classes, and I think it was the Black Student Union that something was going on that didn't quite, it, it, <laughs> you it weren't was. quite pleased with. That, and I was not the uh, initial, I was not the leader of the group, I was a follower. Mm. And uh, I was in my uh, sophomore year when it, when it started in 1969. And uh, I was three, by the way. Oh, is that right? right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Very young man. Right. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so uh, they had just formed the Black Student Union there. Somebody else had the prior class that actually formed it. And uh, so w we were invited to go to a football game. I had never been to a football game in my life. We didn't have a football team in Oklahoma oh, really? when I finished oh, our high school. Uh, so we were invited to go to the football game, so I went following the leader to the football game. And uh, so I didn't know that you had a certain side to sit on. I'm sure mm -hmm. some of the others, I, maybe they knew <laughs> that if you're going to cheer for a team, it's a good idea to be on the side okay. that's cheering for the right, team. Exactly. <laughs> we went on the Ole Miss side. That was the wrong side. The wrong side because we were cheering for the other team. The other team had a black player. And Ole Miss hadn't brought in a black oh. athlete at that point. Mm. So this guy was a running back. I know nothing about football, but this guy was a running back, man, and he had caught the ball and was headed down the sideline. I mean, we were up cheering and going on, and that's when the cups and the bottles and cans and mm. stuff started coming down on us. Wow. We were sitting down here. Again, I'm, I'm assuming they didn't know. I, I certainly only, didn't know. I can only imagine back in those days what was in the cups and exactly. the bottles. Exactly. Yes. So we, we left out. I mean, we left the game early, you know, it just became a little uncomfortable, if you will. And I uh, said, so we left the game early, but we went and just started meeting. And uh, one thing kind of led to another one until we finally came up with this idea of, of going into Fulton Chapel because there was an international singing group there. And uh, we felt like it'd be good publicity and we wanted to bring pu publicity to our plight, our situation mm -hmm. at Ole Miss. And so we went into that event performing group was up with people, international, hmm. interracial, same hmm. group. And uh, we thought it would be just perfect for them. And uh, so we went in chanting, uh, what you gonna do, do it to them. What you gonna do, do it to them. <laughs> and uh, we made our way down to the stage, went up on stage with raised fists. And, uh, and after about a few minutes, I'd say maybe 10 minutes, we heard that the Highway Patrol had surrounded the building. I mean, they were there, uh, they said it was about 75. Had, they had already had them on standby. We had been protesting mm -hmm. you know, for a little while. And uh, so that night they surrounded the building. We come out of the building and uh, the guy that was over the patrol uh, stood up and he said, uh, my name is Chief Stringer. I'll never forget those words and never forget his name. Maybe six to some of us in the group. So they had patrol cars lying all around Fulton Chapel, and all that. And, that. and so these were all black students. Yes, yes, all black students, all black students. So uh, we all three. They put four 
four per per car in the back seat. I mean, you know, you know how to put that right. Pretty, like, pretty tight, yeah. Yeah, pretty tight. And I would put four per car, and uh, they fill up the uh, the Fayette County Jail with us. And after the jail got full, actually uh, another group of blacks who had heard what we had done and gotten arrested, they were trying to have a little meeting to decide how to get us out. Mm. In the meantime, they got rounded up and brought to jail. And all they had done was really sit there in a meeting, but they were black. What was the charge? Disturbing the peace. Wow. Public, disturb public disturbance, something like that. <laughs> so as a result, uh, eventually, the governor got involved and started, you know, complaining about, you know, need to get rid of us. And so they had basically decided they need to get rid of at least some of us, put us out. And so they decided to put eight of us out and put uh, 60 or something on probation. So my question is then, you know, mom has said that she was uneasy about this. And obviously she knew you had some fire or something, I guess, behind you and that she was afraid something of this may happen. So I guess I'm just curious how did that go over when, when mom you know, found out? You know what, I didn't talk to my mom about this. <laughs> do, do you know my mom and I have never sat down to talk about what happened? She's aware, she knows what has happened, but that's one reason I guess I love my mother so much because mm. she handled that right at the right time. Hmm. She let me go ahead. Uh, I finally, decided to breach the subject and it had within the last year I breached the subject with my mother. I said, I said, Mama, I said, I noticed you never asked me what happened at Old Mess. I said, why didn't you? Hmm. We never discussed that. She said, I just felt like you were on a mission. You just felt like that was something that you had to do. Wow. So I just <clears throat> felt like I need to let you go. So you were, uh, I hate to use the word, kicked out. You were kicked yeah, out of yes. Ole Miss. Yeah, I used it because that's exactly what it was. <laughs> you were kicked out of Ole Miss. So what's on your mind then? I know you went on to, is it? Tougaloo. Miss? Tougaloo, okay. Tougaloo. Oh, Tougaloo College. Uh, what happened, we initially were suspended for one year, okay? With understand we could come back in one year. So actually, we went to Tougaloo College during that one year suspension. Now, the year got reduced because we stayed in school under court order uh, for several months, enough for me to finish up the semester, which would have been uh, spring semester 1969. So I was able, 1970, excuse me, in 1970, so we finished that semester. I was, I was carrying uh, 21 hours that that oh, semester. That's pretty heavy. So uh, I was able to get all of my grades for that session. And I was a pretty good student at Ole Miss. I was an honor student. Mm -hmm. uh, matter of fact, they had published it in the Oklahoma paper back that time. I had, uh, uh, they did some of this thing up at Ole Miss saying that I had the highest average among the black students at Ole Miss. You know, I, I made the honor roll in other words with a 3.7. Wow. And that was sort of uh, news at that time, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, uh, oh, anyway, I finished up that semester, picked up the 21 hours, so I had gotten two years behind my belt, transferred to Tougaloo College, and uh, I, found, I found that when I got to Tougaloo College that instead of requiring 130 hours, that was required like at Jackson's Ole Miss, mm -hmm. they only required 120 hours. Wow. So I looked at the hours I had taken at Ole Miss and I had like 80 hated some hours from the time I was at Ole Miss. So I was able to finish up Tougaloo in one year. That's amazing, that's amazing. So I got out of Tougaloo College, man, and Tougaloo saved my life. I've said it to some many times publicly because I was I was pretty, pretty much radicalized at, uh, at Ole Miss during that whole era. Uh, and and it's, it's, I'm actually glad I got kicked out of wow. there because that was a toxic environment and, and you had a person like me in a toxic environment like that, mm -hmm. some things could happen. Right, things so happen. toxic environment, you're trying to learn, you, you're trying yeah. to, obviously you made history there, so I, I imagine that things happen the way they should have. And so you went on to law school? Yes, yes, so from Tougaloo College, I was fortunate enough to be admitted to the University of Michigan mm -hmm. Law School. 
and uh, was also fortunate that, that I was a, a, able to enroll in a 27-month uh, program that allowed me to start in June of 1971 and to finish in 1973. Wow. So I was able to get through law school pretty rapidly. And as soon as I finished law school, I said, now it's time to go back south. <laughs> and my wow. mind was set to come back. I, I mean, I, mm. my mind was dead set. There was no alternative. So that's, that's a pivot point for me because when most people get out of Mississippi, especially about that time, and I'm just kind of learning a lot of that history. You know, if I ever get out of here, I'm not, mm -hmm. not coming yeah. back. But you knew what you were going to face probably when you got back. Oh, no question. I came back for it. Mm. I came back for it. Actually, this this was during the era when the Vietnam War had just basically was winding down. Uh, uh, Nixon, in fact, had uh, called for a moratorium mm. on the draft, and many people, young people, don't realize realize that we were drafted. I didn't have a choice. I was going to have to go to Vietnam because I had a low draft number, and what that meant was that uh, all males. Like at the age of 18, you'd have to go in and they would draw you a number. If my birthday was May 29th, so my number's like 61. They were drafting everybody in that first tier, which was like a number from 1 to uh, 122. If your number was there, you were pretty much guaranteed to go to Vietnam, or at least go to the Army. You know, I was afraid of Vietnam. Hmm. I didn't want to kill in Vietnam. And uh, so fortunately, I was able to get in Tougaloo College and get my deferment. And that's how I managed to get into law school. Once I got in law school, then uh, they had an opportunity to draft me out of law school. But they had a moratorium on the draft my first year in law school. And that's why I was never drafted. Thank you, good Lord. I think God had a plan for you. I thank you, good Lord. For wow. So, and, and and as we get further into this, I think we probably know what that plan was. Now, you you came back to Mississippi, uh, and I'll go ahead and say you're the author of two books right now. Yes. A uh, one, if I'm correct here, to be born black in Mississippi, and the second one uh, that I hold in my hand here is the civil rights lawyer, uh, and it says an angry black man who was not fearful of the KKK. So I'm yeah. holding one in my hand now for our audience. Uh, uh, and I will say, if you haven't gotten this book, please get this book, especially the, the young people out there, uh, the civil rights uh, lawyer. So you came back to Mississippi, you came back to Tupelo. I trained in oh, Jackson. I, okay. yeah, I trained in Jackson for nine months. That was supposed to be a year. But I asked permission from the, it was the NAACP Legal Defense Fund is where I got my training. Okay. And they agreed to also, in a civil rights case that I handled, they agreed to pay the cost. So my filing fees, my deposition mm -hmm. and stuff like that, that obviously I was not able to pay for. But they told me if I wanted to handle the case, and I'd handle the case with the understanding that if I wanted the case, then of course I could collect the fee. Mm -hmm. But uh, most cases were very difficult to, uh, very difficult to win. So you just, I mean, I filed a lawsuit just simply because they needed filing, not because mm. I feel like I could win the case necessarily. So how did you survive? And I, and I know we hadn't talked about the point where you uh, you married your wife, Mr. the very beautiful Mr. Lois Mayfield. Uh, how did you survive off of those? What was the you could, money? Could back survive, no, yeah. you couldn't survive off those uh, cases. Yeah. Uh, but I also took in like family law cases, a few little okay. courses, a few little land matters, just anything. You try to keep the bills paid. But some of your celibates was only a thousand dollars. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and that was after uh, being in trial for about four days. <laughs> four days went to trial. Uh, not, not to mention the work that went into it before trial. So it was not uh, financially rewarding. You know, uh, if if a lawyer practices civil rights nowadays, they can actually do okay mm. practicing civil rights. But you couldn't. You couldn't pay the bill practicing civil rights back uh, in those years. So getting you back here to Tupelo, uh, I did want to mention one other thing before I got into your first uh, uh, case. You moved into Kirkwood Apartments. Yes. And there wasn't a lot of uh, blacks. There were none. <laughs> you were first? Yes, yes, yes. That was interesting by itself because uh, when I first moved to Tupelo, 
When I first moved to Tupelo, there were no one-bedroom apartments available. I was a single man and looking for the cheapest rent you know, that I could find. And the cheapest was a two-bedroom apartment. Back in those years, it was like $165 uh, a month. For, I could get a two-bedroom. And uh, so opportunity came up for a one-bedroom apartment. And by happenstance, I ended up at Kirkwood. I actually went to Evergreen, which Evergreen was later changed over to yeah online there yeah I, I lived out Broadmoor. there Broadmoor first yes I, I Broadmoor lived there. and all that it was Broadmoor then Broadmoor right? then yeah that's right and I went out there looking for a one bedroom apartment and the lady was real nice it was a white lady she was real nice and uh, she said I'm so sorry she said I have to go pick up my son and uh, she said if you'll wait on me I'll be back I got to pick him up and I'll come back and we finish up your paperwork so I, she was real nice and and I don't believe she had intention of discriminating against mm -hmm. me to be clear. Well, in the meantime, I said, just take your time. I said, let me just drive around a little bit and I'll be back. And uh, so Kirkwood is located in close proximity to what used to be Broadmoor Apartments, right. right? So I just drove around Kirkwood. The manager is out in the yard and uh, she was talking to somebody, some other white person out there. And uh, I just let me wonder that. And I was driving uh, a Lincoln Continental. I had a big old long oh, that was, Lincoln Continental. That was, uh, that <laughs> I make a statement with that car. You know? So anyway, I, I let the window down and uh, and I asked him, I said, uh, do y'all have any uh, vacancies out here? And I said, no, you, do you have any uh, uh, two bedroom apartments? Because I knew nobody had the one mm -hmm. bedroom. So I said, do you have two bedrooms? She said, no, we don't. So I looked at her attitude and I said, okay, you're trying to get rid of me. I said, do you have any three bedroom? I'm a single man, mm -hmm. you know, I don't need three bedrooms. Right? <laughs> and she said, no. I said, well, what do you have? She said, one bedroom is all we got. I said, well, I'd like to take a look at that. She said, that's just for one person. I said, it's the only one of me. I don't know the car fool or what. Because, you know, I didn't do that on purpose, though. I mean, I was just. <laughs> but anyway, uh, so I said, can I get an application? She said, no. She said, uh, we don't have an application out here. Let's go downtown. It's right across from One Hour Martin now. Right. It's where Tupelo Realty was handling their apartments. Mm -hmm. So I go down to uh, the building she told me to go to, and the young lady there said, uh, she said, you interested in Kirkwood? I said, yes. She said, I don't think they have. No, she said, let me call. She said, let me call. And so she gets on the phone and conversation that I couldn't hear takes place. She comes back and she said, no, she said, she's sorry, but she made a mistake. She didn't have any one bedrooms. She said, uh, that one was not uh, finished or somebody had a deposit on it. But some re reason, <laughs> I couldn't get the one bedroom. And I said, uh, I told the young lady, I said, who's in charge of these apartments? And she says, Tupelo Realty, uh, uh, Mr. Bill Tate. I don't know if Bill Tate's still living, but uh, I said, Mr. Bill Tate. And I said, well, I need to talk to Mr. Bill Tate. And uh, she said, well, uh, you have to call his office. His office was it was across the street. They moved that house next to one eye Martin Island, right mm -hmm. there by the church. They moved that. Spain House, I believe, is what okay, they call it. Okay. That's where he was situated. She said, uh, you have to call over there. I said, give me the number. So I called over there and asked to speak to Bill Tate. They said he was on vacation. I said, oh, that's too bad. I said, well, who else is in charge? They said, well, his wife. Now, mm -hmm. let me speak to her. She's on vacation with him. I said, well, is anybody in charge when he's out? <laughs> I said, because uh, we got a serious problem. <laughs> so I told her who I was. And she said, uh, well, that would be Richard somebody. And I said, uh, well, you just tell Richard, Kenneth Mayfield call. And uh, if I don't hear from him, by, that was on a Monday. I said, if I do not hear from him by Wednesday, I will file a lawsuit. <laughs> and, 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 and a little backdrop on that now, I had already hit the newspaper mm. in Tupelo prior to that. I had filed suit to get into the into my office building, which was uh, on Main Street, on the second floor. And uh, right across from the uh, Lee County Supervisor's building, where it is now, mm -hmm. and uh, it used to be West Brooks, right. downstairs, and mm -hmm. I was on the second floor. And so the lady 
gave me the cold shoulders when I tried to get that building, and I filed a lawsuit against the property owner. And it was owned by Harry Martin DBA Martin Realtor. I didn't know who Harry Martin was at that time. Mm. But I found out who owned the building, so I filed a lawsuit. And uh, we got it worked out. I give Harry Martin credit, give it credit where it's due. Wow. Whenever uh, he found out what the situation was, and uh, I had actually filed a lawsuit. I didn't, I didn't waste much time. Hmm. I mean, if I got a lawsuit, if you came to me with a lawsuit, I'd file it within days, man, you know. And uh, so anyway, I had filed a lawsuit. Mm -hmm. Harry Martin found out uh, about it. He found a way to get in contact with me through a local person. And he called me and he said, if you'll come back up, he said, I'll try to see if we can straighten this out. Wow. I met with him and, and he showed me the building personally, uh, said he would fix it up to my satisfaction. And that's how I got my first office building. That's, that's, that's awesome. That is awesome. And so now that's your first office building. I'll go ahead and say this right here. Now you have uh, a law office in Tupelo. Yes. South Haven. Yes. And Memphis, Memphis. Tennessee. Wow. Yes. That's, uh, <laughs> that's so, pretty exciting. So back to the story, though. Uh, so I had been in the news here for a couple of cases at that time. So I felt like Richard would know who I was, mm -hmm. you know, when I said, tell him he called me or else. I see him in court. And so, uh, anyway, he calls me. He called me, I think, that same day, if not the next day. And he explained that Bill and Sue Tate were out of town. But uh, he said, uh, he said, let me give me a little chance to investigate and look into it, and I'll get back to you. So uh, he got back to me uh, within a day, I want to say. And he said, when do you want to look at it? And I said, uh, well, uh, you just tell me when. He said, well, we, 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 we can go out there. He said, one o'clock, he said. And I said, uh, okay. I said, now, I had a few little second thoughts there <laughs> by going out there, because he <laughs> said one o'clock. <laughs> yeah, you know, I thought to myself, well, this could be a setup deal, you know. So uh, James Ford and I were friends, and, and James Ford actually had practiced law here before I came. So he was one of the first, first, was he, he the was first? first? He was the, the first. first black yes, attorney in the first. Law. Okay. Uh, so I called James Ford to try to get him to uh, go out there with me, and, and I didn't get him at the time, and but I had already told Richard that I was going to meet him. So I said, well, just go ahead and chance it. So I went out there and met with him. He showed me the apartment, one bedroom apartment, spanking brand new. Nobody had ever been in it. And uh, he told me, he said, she was just mistaken. She didn't know that they were ready. Mm. And so I <laughs> looked at the apartment, saved a few dollars in rent, saved about $10 a month, whatever. Nice little apartment, Kirkwood. And I said, uh, before we left, we reached an agreement. And uh, I said, just so the record is clear on this. I said, now, I know I was discriminated against. Mm -hmm. I said, I just want to be clear, you know. I said, I'm, we got it settled. I mm -hmm. said, I'm, I'm not filing this lawsuit. Mm -hmm. I say that for somebody else. I say, but I know I was discriminated against now. But you fixed it up, and I just wanted an apartment. I was not looking for a lawsuit when I came by. He said, I, I understand. Wow, well, I understand. So we settled that one without a lawsuit uh, of being filed. You know. So you got settled in, and now uh, is it Mr. Cliff Dixon called you? Cliff Your Dixon, first yeah. civil rights case, and I noticed in the book it's called for whites only. Yeah, and I know we won't be able to tear off into this for your time, but I've got to hear some highlights from that first. This is this one <laughs> was kind of interesting, and Cliff Dixon himself was an interesting character in and of mm. himself. Uh, but Cliff had been up north. He had been a taxi cab driver up north, and he came home and took a job as a truck driver for an oil company. And his job took him down to Noxipeta, which is in Winston County, on the other side of Louisville. And uh, he went there making a delivery. He made that delivery around lunchtime, so he said he smelled the food and the room and all that, and he said, yeah, step in here and get me a hamburger. Again, came down from the north, mm -hmm. not realizing the place was segregated. Blacks were not allowed in the front part of that little restaurant. Wow. It was a, it was actually a bus stop. Hmm. The blacks could stand outside and go to the back if they wanted something to eat, but they could not go inside of the restaurant. But spend the same money. Huh? Spend, oh, if you go to the back, yeah, yeah, it's cheaper. And, oh, no, no, no. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, no. So Cliff didn't know this, so Cliff walks in the front of the restaurant 
and they told him, they said, uh, you, need to go, you need to go out, go to the back. Keep in mind, he came from the north. So they told Cliff he needed to go to the back. He said, no, I just want to get a hamburger. And they said, no, you, you need to go to the back. That's where you need to get served. So the owner uh, came to Cliff, and Cliff says he came in and caught him by the elbow. He walked up behind him and caught him by the elbow and grabbed him by the elbow and started jerking him, jerking him out of the uh, restaurant. Hmm. And I mean, physically led him out of there. Took him on the outside and told him where to go if he, want, if he wanted a hamburger. Mm. Otherwise, just get out of here. And uh, so Cliff said, it, you know, it upset him terribly uh, to be manhandled like that. And so Cliff called Dr. Howard Gunn, who was the civil rights lawyer back during that era. And, and Dr. Gunn had furnished an office for me in Oklahoma, mm. free of charge. He didn't charge me for that office. He paid the utility bills on that wow. office personally. He did that. And his daughter even worked for him for a while, you know, free <laughs> until she got tired of it. <laughs> but anyway, uh, Cliff comes to this little office in Oklahoma. He said, Dr. Gunn told me to come see you. And I said, he told me a story. I said, you came to the right place. I said, are you afraid to file a lawsuit? He said, no. I, I said, you know, it can be a little dangerous. Hmm. I said, when you, you meant dangerous, you said a little dangerous. Yeah. But you and I know both back then it was, it was a lot. You know, yeah. Right? You know, I mean, he stand a chance of getting killed back during that time period. Wow. So, uh, I told him, I said, I came here prepared for war. When I came back to Mississippi, I came prepared for war. And I said, but you need to know. And that was part of the training that I got with the uh, NAACP Legal Defense Fund. Make sure the clients know because you don't want to file a lawsuit and then have to go withdraw it. Mm -hmm. You know, by the time you file it, good. Uh, so I made sure he understood, and Cliff said, "I understand." He said, "I'm going all the way with it." I and he said, meant it too. He didn't? meant it, <laughs> and Cliff went all the way with it. <laughs> so uh, we took it to trial. Uh, eventually, about a year later, we ended up in trial in Everdeen, Mississippi, an all-white jury, white jurors, an all-white jury, and uh, the jury gave Cliff Dixon a verdict. When I look back on it, I think how unreal that is mm -hmm. that an all-white jury all right. would give him a verdict on a discrimination case. Mm -hmm. uh, but but it actually happened, and that was the first public civil rights case that had done. I had filed one for myself. Hmm. If I actually two lawsuits for myself at that time. One was against Daybright. Daybright fired right me. Book. Yeah, Daybright fired me when I was still you, in college really at Ole Miss. Out get yeah, fired. man, I get kicked out and get fired everywhere I went. To, you know? So uh, they they fired me. Unfortunately, the case hung around mm. from 1970 when I got kicked out of school. I was working at Daybright that summer after they put me out mm -hmm. of school, and uh, that case hung around from uh, until I finished law school. Wow. So when I finished law school, I told them to give me my right to sue letter. Hmm. They gave it to me, so I filed suit against Daybright. So I think, you know, the Martin Realty and then the Daybright, that was probably the first two. two. Cliff Dixon was the first actual client. So you could practice on yourself first. Yeah, I practiced on myself first. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> make sure you're satisfied. Yeah, with yeah, the, yeah, make sure I'm satisfied with myself. <laughs> yeah, wow. so, so anyway, that was Cliff Dixon case was, was my first real case, and, uh, and, and it was successful. Uh, Cliff Dixon was able to get the thousand dollars worth of damages. We were able to petition the court for attorney's fees, and I had brought in a friend of mine that actually co-counseled with me on that mm. case, uh, Randolph Walker, who's up in Corinth now. Randolph and I co-counseled on that case, and so when we finished the case, I didn't even know what to do when you win a case, okay? And uh, after we won the case, I. Said, I heard the NAACP say you were able to collect attorney's fees under the Civil Rights Act. That was under the Public Accommodations Act. Mm -hmm. And I said, uh, I looked at Randolph. He had never tried a case before either. <laughs> and I said, I think we're supposed to ask for attorney's fees. I told him, I said, you know what I think about that? He said, he didn't know. <laughs> so I said, judge says, anything else? I stood up and said, yes, Your Honor, we'd like to get attorney's fees. <laughs> we had no idea we'd win the case, you know. Wow. And so he said, file your motion. So we filed a motion, and on that case, we collected, uh, it was, I, he gave us attorney's fees of maybe $9,000 or so, and then the lawyer threatened bankruptcy on us and say, said that he was not going to pay it. Mm. But he would pay 4500 and uh, we were broke. 
<laughs> so we said, hey, 4500 I didn't know I was going to get that out of it, you know. So we took the 4500 wow. from it. That, that, that's interesting. So uh, and I, there are so many just stories in, in this, this book, and I, I, I couldn't let it go when I, I first uh, picked it up. But there's another one or two in here, and I, I don't know how our time is. There's another one or two in here, but I wanted to get to Big Iron. Yeah, yeah, Big Iron. But uh, Big Iron was a name that man, people he was feared to be him, feared. right? Yeah, he was to be feared by blacks and whites. Big Iron was feared. He was a big guy. He was about 6'5", maybe 350 pounds, wow. or something like that. Real huge guy. And uh, people literally feared him. He didn't even wear a uniform, 1975. Okay. He didn't even wear a uniform. He didn't have to. Everybody knew who he was. So what happened, a young lady that ended up uh, getting accosted by him was uh, waiting for a parking place around the courthouse uh, where you pull in that little park and, you know, uh, and diagonal parking right around the courthouse. And she was waiting on somebody to back out, and he pulled up behind her, and, and he came up and knocked on the one that she was driving a 62 Ford, 62 Ford Falcon, I believe she told me. And uh, he beat on the one that she said she shocked her, you know, but she looked, she had a two-year-old son in the car with her. And she looked up, but she didn't know who he was. He didn't even have on a uniform. She did not know him. Hmm. And uh, he told her, let, let the one of she said she let the one of them out and said, uh, get this damn trap out the road. And she said she looked at him. That's the recording now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what she's mm -hmm. talking about? And he said, she said some words to him that he didn't like. They said, uh, I don't think she cursed him or anything like that, but she just uh, spoke up to him. And uh, so he opened the car door and uh, jerked her out of the car. And her, her foot ended up getting trapped some kind of way up under the brake or something in the car. And uh, the car was still in drive. She just sitting over the foot on the brake. And so uh, the car ended up being ro rolling down the road, child screaming, and uh, so eventually he jumped. He didn't go in, but he reached in and pushed the gear and just slapped it back up in the park. That's how he stopped it. Wow. And so the NAACP of, of Apprentice County actually got in contact with me and asked me if I would handle the case, take the mm -hmm. case. Well, by that time, I, I said by that time I had filed I don't know dozens of civil rights cases, you know. By some, that time, some experience on you. Yeah, I had experience <laughs> then. You know, I worked on myself, I worked on Cliff, you know. And uh, so I told them to come on in, let's talk about it. And they came in, so I accepted the, accepted the case. And uh, man, we started meeting up there, and, and uh, let's see if we can uh, put some pressure on this old sheriff. And so we actually met one of the black churches there uh, in Prentice County, opened their doors to us. And uh, we went in, had a mass meeting, and I mean, it, it was packed. Church was packed, standing room. So the guy's supposed to jump off the elevator when Big Iron gets on. Wow. The guy stayed on the elevator, man, and, and Big Iron pistol whipped him. Mm. In the hospital. This guy was working there at the hospital. He didn't read the policies and proceed. <laughs> yeah. <so. laughs> oh, man, yeah. but uh, in a way, after they heard about that, I have been retained. I think we may have had a news conference. I don't know, but anyway, they decided to arrest her before she was supposed to be appearing in court. She was supposed to come to court to defend herself on this improper parking. Mm. That's what he charged her with. Wow! Improper and parking. After he was going to drag her. Yeah, out because she was sitting there waiting to oh, park, wow. park, right? Improper parking is what he charged her with, and uh, so. In the meantime, the night before we were supposed to go to court, she gets arrested. And he's already... That's, that's weird. Yeah. <laughs> yeah already got to go to court now on improper park. But they got it, they said, what, a, a bad check. Hmm. She was in jail, so they called me and asked me if I could come up to the jailhouse immediately and get out of there. I said, but not tonight. I said, I'll be there tomorrow. I said, somebody from the family or somebody like that will need to go down and see about it uh, tonight. Hmm. But... Uh, I'll be there tomorrow morning. And shoot, by the next morning, word had spread over the whole community, you know. Wow. And everybody was there in, uh, around the jailhouse. She's in jail. Mm. And the old Prince County Jail was a basement jail. You had to go in the basement wow. to go to the jailhouse, yeah. 
And uh, so she was down in the jailhouse, and it was a whole group of us, maybe, shoot, I don't know, a hundred, a hundred people were out there. And so uh, we got ready to go in the jailhouse, I mean, into in the, well, jailhouse, no, I guess you call that the sheriff's office or mm -hmm. whatever. And uh, bam, they closed the door on us. They wouldn't let us in. We was going to go in mm -hmm. as a group, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, bam, they slammed the door. And so they had a curtain. Next thing you know, the curtains, they pulled the curtain. And so somebody said, man, they, they beating up Evelyn in the jail. Wow. And you guys are locked outside. We locked on the outside. So uh, just knock on the door. This public building, let it, you know, knock on the door. So we stood outside just routinely knocking on the door. And eventually the door opens. I was at the front. Hmm. And uh, he said, come on in. <laughs> I ain't got a question there. Now, did he say, everybody come in or you come no, in? No, he told me to come in. So I told everybody else, I said, come hmm. on in. Okay. And then he said, nope, they can't come. Just you. Just you. And so they told me, they said, you know, the crowd is telling me, don't you go in there by yourself? Mm -hmm. Don't you go in there by yourself? I said, I'm all right. Mm -hmm. I said, I'm all right. So uh, they opened the door and I went in there by myself. Evelyn was, was actually in there at the time and she was crying and it, she was just hysterical over the whole, whole thing. She had spent the night in jail. Mm -hmm. And so they finally decided to bring her up out of the basement, out of jail. And, and then I'm standing here the sheriff was sitting down, the same old big sheriff, I'm telling you. He was sitting big behind man. his desk, sitting down just as cool as a cucumber. He sat behind his desk, and uh, he said, all she got to do is sign the paper. She won't sign the paper. So Evelyn was crying. She said, I, I'm not signing that paper. That, paper. That, ain't, that ain't right. I said, sheriff, I said, can I see the paper? Said, yeah. <laughs> so he showed me a piece of paper, which was uh, nothing but a bond. Mm. And I said, uh, Evelyn, I said, come on over and sign the paper. I said, just uh, come on, you know. Oh, that ain't what he showed me. That ain't what I... Boy, she was hysterical. But there is one, uh, well, maybe a couple of the things that I want to get into. I want to, we got about five minutes. I want to touch a little bit on the Tupelo boycott. But then in closing, I need to know where you feel that we are today as a uh, black race. We talking 1976 when, when the case came down. Now the boycott it happened in 1978, that's after the case had been won in, in federal court. But he comes to uh, Tupelo and uh, he was a career criminal. He had a long history of, mm -hmm. of crime. And so he came down to commit a few forgeries and he was good. He, mm -hmm. The police officers, man, had this guy uh, uh, signing their name and they wow. said you couldn't tell them <laughs> they, they signed their own name he was just that good mm -hmm. i mean he he man this guy was good but anyway uh he was on his way back from doing a few little forgeries in in tupelo and he made it back to marshall county and they stopped him in marshall county uh which was pretty easy to identify a black man with a white woman mm -hmm. at that time, mm -hmm. you know and uh they stopped him brought him back to tupelo and back to Tupelo in the old jailhouse that was across from the Lee County Sheriff Department, mm. you remember that one. And uh, there is where they uh, ruffled him up. <clears throat> he had processed hair. Mm -hmm. I mean, he was slick, clean, wow. like, looking good, <laughs> right. And uh, man, you, you should have seen the pictures later. That processed hair was strung all across <laughs> his head. Mm. And this guy, I look blue. Wow. It was just, they messed with him. But anyway, uh, they wouldn't let him call from Tupelo City Jail. So you stayed there during that time. I want to say it was three days. And after three days, you'd be transferred over to the county mm -hmm. for felony offenses. And uh, when he got to the county is when he called me. And so when he called, uh, then I immediately went down to the jailhouse. Uh, that was the county jail. And I looked at him, and I mean, he was still a wreck. I mean, his eyes were bloodshot still. And uh, and he said, I just got here. He said, just got in there. But time he got to the counter, the counter let him make a phone call. And I said, so I told whoever the jailer was, I said, uh, I, I, need, I need to go get something. I said, I'll be right back. 
So I went to my office, had one of those old Polaroid cameras, mm -hmm. you know, picture shooting yeah. at the bottom. <laughs> yeah. I had a little old camera like that that I always uh, would have, but this time I don't know why I didn't take it with me. And I needed a witness, so I called James Ford. Okay, Mr. Ford. Called James Ford okay. again. And I said, uh, I said, man, I need you to go witness something for me. I said, I just need you, I just need a witness if you do that. He said, yeah. So he and I went together back over to the jailhouse. He's just there as a witness. I took my pictures and uh, and then I let him go and then I interviewed Pastor and he told me what had happened. I took the case in. We filed a lawsuit against uh, Dale Kruber, Roy Sandifer, and several unknown officers at that time. About six of them, I think it was, that he said were in the room. And uh, we filed that lawsuit, took it to trial, made the trial in it maybe a year and a half, a couple of years later. And uh, Judge Omar Smith was a federal judge. And uh, right before we presented that case, uh, I had met with Dr. Neely, Dr. James Neely. Mm -hmm. And I'm telling you, Dr. Neely was one of a kind. Wow. I mean, a man with large cigars and real community, real community. I just think the world of Dr. Neely. But anyway, Dr. Neely agreed to see him after I got him released from the, the jail, Neely's office for medical treatment. So Dr. Neely agreed to be a witness at, at court, and he testified at court, and it went something like this. Uh, I examined him, and I determined that the uh, bruises that he had uh, were at least three days old. The city had maintained a position that we took the photograph right before he was transported. Mm. They said <laughs> that's when they took the picture, so he had to be beat up in the county jail mm -hmm. if he got beat up. Wow. They didn't do it. Mm -hmm. Thought that was going to be a winning argument. And Dr. Nita got on here and he said, you look at the discoloration in the skin, he said that would take at least uh, 18 to 24 hours before it would start turning dark like that. And he said, and better yet, he said, look at the beard. He said, that beard, that's about a three-day beard. Boy, that's exactly consistent with mm -hmm. what we were saying. And uh, he had a beard. Well, not like man, but mm -hmm. but you know what a three-day beard right. looks like. You, you hadn't shaved for three mm -hmm. He was clean shaven. Mm -hmm. But then it was, right, okay. That beard had grown out for three days. And, uh, man, we uh, looked, looked around to see what the judge, how he was going to look. Judge Smith said, do you have a photograph? Yes, Your Honor, we do. Yes, and and Judge uh, Smith looked at the photograph of this guy with his hair disheveled and uh, beard and all that stuff, and he just kind of gave it back and kind of tried not to show any emotion, but you knew that was a mm. stinger, man. And the city got caught off guard because they were just simply going to rely on the officers to testify mm -hmm. that we had just taken the picture and whose words you got? The officer's word against the convict, I mean, you know, the prisoner. And, uh, but when he testified that I was a three-day beard, it lined up. Mm -hmm. Judge Smith ruled in our favor and gave us a verdict on that case. And that shocked the city wow. to no end. Boris Grayson was on the council at that time. Now he was the only African-American? He was the only one, the first one elected. And uh, he was on the council, so I reached out to uh, Mr. Grayson. I said, Mr. Grayson, I said, uh, you got some uh, bad officers on that police department. I said, it's two of them, the federal judges has found that they beat up this black guy. And I said, we need to see if we can get them off that force. Mr. Grayson, he was another hero of mine. He really was, I mean. Uh, we were involved in a lot of different civil rights movements together. But anyway, uh, he called for a council meeting to discuss this issue, or have it put on the agenda. Uh, we went down in force to uh, complain and ask that they be taken off. Eventually they said, no, because the judge really didn't say that they did it. The judge said they were responsible for it. Hmm. And fine line distinction, so therefore uh, we're going to keep them on the police force. Skip Robinson, who had formed the United League, uh, uh, came in to a meeting we were holding up at Spring Hill Missionary Baptist Church uh, after we had gone down to the City Hall. And, uh, and I remember he came down and touched me on the shoulders. He said, uh, as if I was in charge. I was not in charge there at Spring Hill. But Mr. Grayson hadn't even finished up his council meeting. Mr. Stone and 
I think Mr. Herford, maybe some other deacon, were there at Spring Hill, and they had let us in. So uh, Skip Robertson came down and touched me on the shoulders and asked me, he said, you mind if I say something? It's open, open season, I'm not even in charge, you know what I mean? So he went down and got the microphone, and man, he was fired. He, he, you know, he's a pretty fiery guy. And so he said, well, we need to do a boycott. <laughs> it knocked me, mm. caught me by surprise. I, I didn't know he was going to do that now. And I feel like what I always try to do is be diplomatic, you know, meet with the, you know, meet with Mrs. Mm. Grace, meet with everybody. Right. I never would have announced that, you know, but mm. he announced it that night, and it hit the press. And the rest is history. That boycott wow. couldn't, couldn't control, couldn't. Couldn't stop it at that point. Mm. So several local leaders, the white leaders, tried to uh, stop it. Skip Robertson was in charge. I've had him to, to call me trying to see if I can stop it. I said, I'm telling you, if y'all want to stop this, I'm telling you what you need to do. You got to convince the man that called the boycott. I, <laughs> I ain't trying to shy and away from Skip him. Robinson. That was Skip Robertson. Right. I said, I'm telling you, this is the man that's in charge. He calls the shots on this deal. You know. I probably would have tried to work something out and, and, and get back to some peace and harmony, but Skip wouldn't hear that now, I'm telling you. He was fired. Wow. So anyway, we boycotted, man, in the streets, and, and we had the worst. I'm going to tell you this one. I'm going to close this one. But we, we met the Ku Klux Klan uh, right in front of Spring Hill Missionary Baptist Church. I'm a living witness. Uh, the Klan were coming east of the direction on Jackson, and they made a left turn. And man, we just knew they were gonna keep it straight on Jackson. They made a left turn, and see, we are coming down Green Street. So you're, Green. you're looking at this You meeting. know you're gonna clash. You're gonna clash. You're gonna clash. It, man, these guys are crazy. It was only about, I bet, not even 20 of them, and it was at least 1,500, 2,000 of us. Wow. I said, those guys got some nerves, man. And it was some guys in, in, in our group that were definitely radical and plenty had plenty of guns. Mm -hmm. So, man, it was like countdown, countdown. They were driving, they were in a car, and the rest of them were walking around the car with the guns. Mm -hmm. and, and the leader, they said, was the one that was inside the car. That's about to be a bloodbath. Yeah, about to be a bloodbath. So they come up close to us. We covering the whole street. And he didn't come in with a car. No police officers to be seen. Blood man, man, they came down by the time they got up with us. Then the crowd started easing over a little bit. The, the car went all the way to the edge, and it started going by. And so I said, okay, okay, maybe, maybe we can get by this with our blood bath. And all of a sudden, several of those black guys, man, went over and started, like they're going to turn the car over. Oh, my goodness. Guys sitting inside with the rifles, man, and the guys all around. Now the shot was fired, though. Let's say the good Lord was in that plan. Mm. Uh, man, but anyway, they kept bouncing the car, and uh, and I think it was Skip, Skip Robertson probably was one who finally got him to back off and leave the car alone, you know, and we kept on, kept on marching. So. That's how we. That's how we got through that. Yeah, what, a, what a story you tell it so well, uh, Mr. Mayfield. In closing, uh, I just want to personally thank you uh, on behalf of Project Delay for being with us. Uh, any closing statements on where you think we are today, as far as uh, race relations? Uh, you know, I think I personally believe that we've come a long way from what you're telling me, but uh, I still know that there's quite a ways to go. After Barack Obama was elected president, in my opinion. We've honestly lost ground now. We're in a weaker position now than we were during the year that Barack, he was first elected in 2008, I believe. Uh, we were, as a, as a race and as a people, we were in a stronger position then than we are now. Some of this may be backlash, you know, white backlash as a result of seeing the black man all the way to the highest position what you're doing here today, I commend you for it. Uh, I just hope that more people will take up the mantle now and, and that we're going to have to educate our community, uh, let them know about our history, where we've come from. Carter G. Watson said, if we don't learn our history, we are destined, it's destined to repeat it. And we can find ourselves back in slavery. Do I believe we'll be back in slavery? 
the answer to that would be a, a no. I really don't think that will happen. But we could end up back in second-class citizenship in this country. So that's my statement. Ms. Mayfield, I appreciate you. Thank you for all you've done. Thank you for your sacrifices. And I know that you've got some roads ahead, some goals, things you want to do. So may God complete the team to bless you and thank your you. family. Thank and, you. and thank you for allowing us this time. I'm humbled. Thank you. I wish we had more time. I wish we had more time. <laughs> thank you, sir.